Good morning and welcome to To The Point. Over the past week or so, you have heard a lot about same-sex marriage in Michigan from those who support and those who oppose the idea. But before the latest news on those rulings started to break, we sat down with the chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party. Lon Johnson talked to us in depth about Decision 2014, about how he, as a new chairman of the party, will approach his first major election, and some of the behind-the-scenes work that he and his party are doing. This morning, that conversation with the chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party, Lon Johnson. Let's start with what a remarkable year this has been for you. There's a lot of election stuff we want to talk about, but it was in February of 2013 that you were elected chairman of the party. First time in a long time Democrats in the state had a new chairman. Uh, what do you know today that you didn't know in oh, February of 2013? You're looking at a very happy chairman. <laughs> um, you know, we've got two great statewide candidates, both, uh, both ahead in the polls, both with no primary. We're united around uh, you know, the, the leaders of our ticket, number one. Um, number two, we've got three targeted congressionals uh, here in Michigan. Uh, two of those without a primary. We're feeling good there. Um, the Democrats are united and uh, we're fired up to win in November. This We've got is, a plan. This is a, uh, uh, it's a little hard to overstate and I know mm -hmm. it's a little bit inside politics but I think it's worth talking about because we, we want to get to the races and talk about those individually. But being able to have a candidate for U.S. Senate and a candidate for governor, and at least two of those targeted races that you're talking about in the U.S. House mm -hmm. without primaries mm -hmm. is a big financial boon for both the candidates and for you as a chairman of the party. Yes, it's beyond finance. You know, also, what that does is it gives us time, time to organize, time to develop a strategy, time to work together. And that's what, that's what you need. When you're taking on an incumbent governor, um, you know, that's going to have all of $50 million. Um, you need time to organize. You need time to plan and to build. We've got everything we need in Michigan here to win as the Democratic Party. We've got the issues. We've got the voters. We've got the candidates. We've got the strategy. Now we need to bring it all together and drive it home and win. I want to talk about all those things, but first let's talk about the House races because we won't spend as much time on those between now and November. And by mm -hmm. the way, I should point out, by the time this airs, we're taping this a little in advance, by the time this airs, it's about a month before the filing deadline. So things are really starting to shake out. We, mm -hmm. We're going to have a good idea who's mm -hmm. running. Talk to me about those uh, congressional races where you're really getting targeted. And sure. Well, we've got you know uh, Pam Burns running uh, in the uh, 7th Congressional District against Congressman Wahlberg. She's doing a phenomenal job. She's um, a six-year uh, state house member. She's an attorney. Um, we couldn't be more pleased. Emily's list has come in and targeted that race. Same with the DCCC. Um, up north, we have Jerry Cannon, uh, a former two-star general, uh, a Vietnam and Iraq War veteran, 16-year um, county sheriff. You know, take on Congressman Beneshek. You know, the DCCC has uh, announced there's 15 races nationwide that they'll be targeting. These are three of them in Michigan we have, and two of them are right here with those two, uh, with Gary, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, Jerry Cannon and Pam Burns. Um, when you look at that, uh, particularly when you look at that 7th district down there, that has been one of the more changeable districts right. over the past 20 years. Yes. We, we've seen Back quite, and forth. quite a bit of, uh, of changing, not just uh, in a Republican primary, we saw changes in Democratic mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the, your candidate for governor uh, once held that congressional seat when it was drawn differently. Yep. And the other thing we should point out this year that does create a little bit of a difference is uh, that since a, a lot of these are only the first year through a new uh, first first uh, time through that cycle, that, that uh, cycle through that district through the district has mm -hmm. been redrawn. So uh, there is, they are a little different than they were perhaps when they were first won. Yep. All right. So much uh, for congressional races. We will have time to talk about those as we move forward. Let's talk about the party as a whole. You say you're a happy chairman. Uh, you've avoided the primaries in these big races. What is the party like as you get geared up? Because uh, we had uh, former Congressman uh, Mark Schauer was here a couple of weeks ago. And he mm -hmm. talked about people coalescing behind his candidacy for government, yes. uh, for governor. Uh, you talk about having time to do the things that you want to do. What are you feeling? What are you hearing from rank and file Democrats as you travel around, as you do all the time? Mm -hmm. We were talking about before we went on the air. You're constantly on the road, going to meetings, dinners, etc. What do you hear? from the folks who call themselves Democrats, who pay dues to the party, and who are, I'm quite sure, uh, bridling a bit to get control back because as we sit here now, Republicans control virtually everything in the state of Michigan that can be elected. You know, in my 25 years of running political campaigns, I've never seen a Democratic Party so fired up. Every meeting we go to, we're having to park a little bit further away and walk a little further into the meeting or bring in chairs. 
Um, we're, you know, as you said, in Michigan, we feel Michigan's a democratic state, but in the off years, we, uh, we've been losing. Non-presidential years. Non-presidential years. We've been losing. And what we've done is really try to figure out why. Why is that? And Democrats are very frustrated with that. Um, and what we've gone through is found and identified uh, 995,000 ID Democrats that typically don't turn off and off year elections. Democrats are going to work very hard to approach those voters, engage them, and turn them out. They're fired up, you know, because the results are too, you know, winning isn't just a, an, op uh, an opportunity, it's an obligation. Because when we don't win, bad things happen in Michigan. When we don't win, it's $1.8 billion tax breaks to corporations and CEOs. When we don't win, it's a billion dollars taken out of our education. You know, there's not one constituency in the state of Michigan that isn't paying a price for this governor's action, whether it's, it's African Americans with emergency managers, labor with right to work, women with the right to choose, labor with right, uh, I'm sorry, labor with the right to work, I think I already discussed that. Um, teachers with a billion dollars out of their classroom, seniors with a pension tax. Everyone is paying attention and they're fired up and ready to win. When you talk about the numbers, this state uh, votes narrowly in, in those races. Not mm -hmm. so much in the presidential races, particularly in the last cycle, President Obama uh, uh, and, and, and in the cycle before, in both cases had pretty good margins here. But in those off-year elections, if you, could, so if you could turn out half even yep. of those voters, that could have an impact That's on statewide, statewide races, as well as state house and potentially state senate, although a little more difficult in state senate seats. Correct. It, it, that will have enormous impact, this turnout that we're putting together, this turnout operation, will have enormous uh, impact, not just on the race for Gary Peters and the, uh, to replace Carl Levin or, or Mark Schauer uh, for governor. The, uh, the impact down ticket will be enormous. You know, we had 26 races in the state house in 2012 that we lost narrowly by less than a 2,500 vote swing. Democrats lost 21 of them out of those 26. We think that if we can go in and identify those 10 key seats and pick up six of them, and uh, we can take back the state house, and we'll do that through turnout. And is is that? Overall turnout, and I, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but, but as an observer, I'm always interested. Do you do that by trying to turn out people at the precinct level or at the uh, at the state house level, or do you do it from top down? By you, getting do it, you do it actually in the individual level. One thing that the Obama um, technology that we're bringing into the state allows us to do is to really key in on the individual. Right? We know those 995,000. We know their name, their address, their phone number. Um, you know, I always joke that you give these, this Obama team a few more weeks, they'll have their blood type. <laughs> you know, we know how to communicate with them, so we have to hit them where they, where they, commu where they live. We have to hit them online. We have to hit them at their workplace. Um, this technology that, that we're bringing into the state allows us to really identify those, those people uh, on an individual basis and talk to them about issues that they care about in ways that they're receptive to. You mentioned the uh, Obama organization. Your wife was heavily involved mm -hmm. uh, in that 2012. Uh, and we know, I mean, I, I, and I think we discussed it the last time you were here, that one of the, the times I'd never seen this before, we were ready for a, a big uh, then Senator Obama race, going back to mm -hmm. 2008, uh, rally, I should say. And uh, four or five times before the candidate ever showed up, somebody would come out and say, "Hey, text, text whatever this. to the you know to this number, and we'll keep you updated about the campaign and updates." Mm -hmm. Which meant that on election day, they had direct contact with tens of thousands, hundreds, millions, millions. of voters yeah, millions. that they could directly contact. And mm -hmm. so this is the the kind of technology you're talking about. But let's talk about the president in general. Mm -hmm. The the president uh, was in Michigan not long ago to yep, sign the Lansing. farm bill mm -hmm. uh, with Senator. Stabenow. Is it your intention, and I know it's not completely up to you, but is it your intention to bring him back to the state to, to use him as a focal point for this election cycle? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Michigan, um, with a governor's race up and the uh, targeted uh, Senate and the targeted congressionals, we want the president as much as he will come to Michigan. And you expect that to be a few times, or do you know? Uh, let's hope. You know, but I do, you know, as you know, my wife worked for the president. I, we, we've got a few inside phone numbers there that will be working very hard to bring him in. So what exactly, as chairman of the party, can you ask members of your party to do? And how do you get results? When we come back, we'll talk with the chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party about that, to the point. 
Welcome back to To The Point. Just two weeks ago on this program, we talked to the chairman of the Michigan Republican Party, Bobby Shostak. He told us about what he hopes to achieve during Decision 2014. Now, it's the Democrats' turn as we talk with the Michigan Democratic Party chairman, Lon Johnson. Let's talk a little bit about this race for Senate. Uh, some people were a little surprised, and I think I'd have to count myself among those, that Senator Levin decided not to run. Mm -hmm. It leaves a big vacuum for the state of Michigan because he has been there for so long and in such a powerful position, not just because of his committee chairmanship, but because of the fact that Carl Levin is well known on Capitol Hill. So tell me uh, in that race what you see as the keys because with an open seat and with Republicans nationwide wide trying hard to pick up those six or seven Senate seats that they think they need to control the Senate, Michigan is going to be one of those in play. What are the keys to that race for you uh, and for Congressman Peters? Well, you know, Michigan voters are asking, being asked to make a big decision. Who to replace Senator Levin? You know, that uh, uh, a senator who served our state for 34 years in the Senate and you know, before that many other positions. Um, we have to ask, we have to demonstrate to the voter who's going to go to Washington and not be a part of this bitter, partisan, do-nothing uh, atmosphere. Who are we going to send to replace an, uh, you know, a, a terrific senator that's, that's worked on a bipartisan basis to get things done? We believe that's Gary Peters. Now, Gary is going out there um, and made himself very accessible. You know, he's got a proven track record um, of you know, working on a bipartisan basis to rescue the auto industry, holding Wall Street accountable. He's someone who knows how to get things done on a bipartisan basis. We need to demonstrate that to the voters. When you look at how that race shapes up, it, it's going to be expensive. There's no question about it. There's already mm -hmm. outside money that has come in. Uh, certainly, millions. The, those folks already uh, that uh, are, are going to challenge uh, Congressman Peters for that position. How much do you have to focus? Uh, I know the candidate has to spend an awful lot of time doing fundraising just to make a race like that work. How much time do you, as a party chairman, have to spend trying to make sure that that race gets the attention it needs from Washington, from the Democratic Senatorial Committee, and, and, and those big Democratic outside groups that will be supporting candidates around the country? Well, this race is going to get um, all the attention it, desire, it, 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 it needs. Um, Gary is a... Uh, Congressman Peters is a, is a terrific, um, you know, individual, and he's going to be getting the support that he needs out of Washington and out of this party and out of the Democratic infrastructure. Let's talk about the race for governor. Mm -hmm. This is a really interesting matchup because the history of incumbents, as you well know in this state, is that it's a much easier race for incumbents. Absolutely. You have to go back sure. all the way back to, to Jim Blanchard mm -hmm. to, to find uh, an incumbent governor uh, that gets unseated. So what do you have to do? What are the keys in the race? I, I, you know, we're, we're at this time where there's a lot of basketball going on. You may sure. have noticed. I feel like we're getting, you know, the X's and O's for basketball to figure out uh, the keys uh, to these races. But really, it, there is a strategy that you mm -hmm. have to try to follow, particularly when you take on an incumbent. Sure. You know, the polling um, is not looking so so good for this governor. Now, you just got some recent polling that you and mm -hmm. I were talking about off the air, and mm -hmm. this is from a national pollster, not a Michigan-based pollster, That's correct. Who, who has a track record of getting numbers uh, pretty solidly. Pretty accurate. Uh, talk to me, uh, to whatever degree you want to, but talk sure. to me how you see those numbers and what you think that means for your campaign. Well, we're seeing a, we're, we've seen a, a series of three to four different polls that are coming out all saying the same thing. Um, that this is a race within two to three points. Our poll showed 45, 42. We've seen other uh, polls come out recently showing 47, 44, uh, with the governor with a slight edge. Um, it's because the voters understand that, that this governor um, is not working for them. This, what, you know, that, that his, his efforts are out there working for the wealthy and the well-connected. You know, for instance, creating a $1.8 billion tax break and, and paying for that by cutting schools by a billion dollars, taxing senior pensions, reducing um, uh, services to our cities, they're done with it. They're seeing that what this governor's approach is isn't working. And the polls are reflecting that. Now, you know, uh, we've got a lot of work to do with Mark Schauer. He's got to go out there and make his case and introduce himself. It's just not enough to go out there and tear down uh, the incumbent. He's got to go out there and make his case, and when, we, when he does, we believe that we'll win in November. When do you consider the electorate really engaged? I mean, there, there is another side to the not having a primary that just kind of flashed through my mind, and that is 
come August, there's not going to be a great deal of attention being paid to, for example, the gubernatorial race or perhaps that senatorial race on either side because there's mm -hmm. not going to be a primary, we presume, at this point. So when do voters really get engaged? You and I never disengage. We, you right. know, we, we do this every day. But you know, a lot of folks are busy making a living and dodging potholes, which we will talk about in a moment, and all of the other things that go along with daily life. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do beforehand, but when do when do people, those likely voters, really get engaged? Now, you know, uh, the, the, the voters are being engaged every time they hit a pothole. The voters are being engaged every time their children go to an overcrowded classroom. They're being engaged every time they see just bitter, partisan rancor come out of Washington. They're engaged. What we need to do is show them how we're going to fix this. We need to bring the candidates to the table and they need to talk about how they're going to create a state where we can stay and succeed. Why do you call them Snyder holes? <laughs> Who else should we blame this on? <laughs> uh, I mean, look, this governor, uh, this Republican Party and this governor, they run, they've got the governorship, the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, the secretary of state, the Supreme Court, the House, the Senate. If this governor could see his way through to giving a $1.8 billion tax break, to wealthy, you know, to, to the wealthy and the well-connected, well, surely he can fix our roads. You know, the other day he had a press conference, um, and he said, and he, called, he told a constituent who complained about the roads, well, call your legislature. Call your legislator. That's your job, Governor. Get it done. You run every aspect of Lansing, and you're telling constituents to call a legislator? That's your job. Get it done. You're a party chairman. You don't have one of those 110 votes or one of those 38 on the other end. But let me ask you, since you brought it up, sure. where do you get that money? Where, where do you get that money? Well, right now, they're sitting on over a $900 million surplus. But that's one-time money. That's one-time money. But this, you know, this, this governor is calling on a, you know, potentially a gas tax. You know, or registration fee. Perhaps. Or registration fee. Well, we already pay enough. Our pensions have been taxed. Our schools have been uh, 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 have seen their funding reduced. You know, the average Michigan driver pays over three hundred dollars a year in costs and repair costs to their automobile as a result of the damages created by these roads. That's a hidden tax. We're already paying enough. Get this done. What do you see as a key? And it, it's, it varies, but because we're talking about this very localized issue because potholes while they are generalized around the state they are a very local issue for people you know that pothole sure. at the corner of college and whatever mm -hmm. people are always talking about that is that something that plays into your strategy too when it comes to some of these state house races is that the kind of thing that you think candidates can challenge sitting members on absolutely you know um you know even in the most limited view of government it's keep the roads going and provide for a national defense, right? This governor has reduced expenditures, reduced municipal revenue sharing, even if you wanted to blame the cities for this, okay? And you didn't want to blame Lansing. Municipal revenue sharing has re been reduced by $6 billion over the last 10 years. Where's our legislature on this? Where's our governor on this? They've been shifting money out of these municipalities so that this governor can stand up on a stage and take credit for a $900 million surplus. Well then, let's put it back and let's get going. Let's get these roads fixed. Let's get our cities and towns working again. What do you tell your, and I, I, I refer th to them as constituents because to some degree they are, the members of the Democratic Party who elected mm -hmm. you uh, over a year ago. When you go out to these events, and I know sometimes they're pretty intimate, sometimes you've got big rooms full of a lot of people. Lately these days it's been bigger larger rooms than uh, smaller, yeah, but more bigger than smaller. What do, sure. you, what do you tell them above all? I mean, you, you mentioned when you were here before um, that there really is an obligation, you feel like there's an obligation for you as a chairman and for the party as a whole to go out and win. Yes. But what do you tell those folks in that room that they need to do? How uh, You already say they're engaged, but now mm -hmm. how do you turn that engagement into action? Precisely. Here's the path. First off, the Democratic Party needs to believe again. All that happened in 2010 is we lost. We lost bad. But this is still a Democratic state. This is still our state. And we need to go in and we need to show them, here's the path to victory. Here are the numbers. Here's how this gets done. Here's your part. Here's how you can contribute to winning. And when you do that, what do you hope happens when you walk out of that door? Because here's something that has always been a mystery for me, and I've talked to your opposite number in the Republican Party about this. You can go out, you can talk, you can energize, mm -hmm. 
you can do all of those things. How do you how do you track this? We call it, we call it the go do. Yeah, uh, you know you got to give every single activist when somebody walks into a campaign and says, "How can I help?" And if you can't answer in forty five seconds how they can help and how they can contribute to victory, your campaign is going to lose. And if you can't measure that, you're going to lose. So how do you measure? How do you do that? Well, I don't want to give too many of our tricks. Well, yeah, yeah. right, but <laughs> but we have to give. You know, the secret to Obama was that he made. You know, he, he turned that, con that supporter into a, a volunteer, a volunteer into a contributor, a contributor into a raiser. Two key points here. He made it easy, number, and number two, he made it intuitive. That the person doing the asking and the person being asked saw how that contributed to the common goal, the shared goal of winning the presidency. We have to do the same thing. We have to show that activist or that volunteer, that person who's angry about a pothole, here's what you have to do to change this. And here's how, you know, here's the tools to get it done, and then here's how we're going to make sure it gets done. The millennials will mm -hmm. increasingly be part of this electorate, mm -hmm. if not so much in this cycle, certainly by 2016. Yes. That means technology is going to be more important than ever. When you were last year, you talked about, and again, I'm not asking you yeah. to give away secrets, but in general, how much do you have to change the way you as a party within the state and nationally? Mm -hmm. But how, do you, how much do you have to change the way you engage? Because there is going to come a time when buying that uh, television commercial, which I highly advise, but when buying that television commercial may not not be as the, the only or the most effective way yes. to, to get to voters. So how far in advance do you have to prepare for that? Now, you know, when, you know, organizi organization, you know, uh, UAW is a prime example. They organized in the, in, in the local, you know, and, and you know, uh, today what we need to do is recognize where this, where the, where the population is going and they're going online. The internet just wasn't invented, yes, you know, ten, you know, it's here to stay. It just wasn't invented last year. It's here. That's where people educate themselves. That's how people get inspired. It's how they inspire others. It's how they conduct commerce. We must meet them there. We must find them and meet them there and engage them online. And you're going to see a very robust effort out of the Michigan Democratic Party and our candidates this year, unlike our uh, previous, uh, previous years. So you know, when we took over the Michigan Democratic Party, we had very few emails. We had very few cell phone numbers. We had a very limited presence on social media. We're going to quadruple that. And, it's, and if we don't, we will lose. Mr. Chairman, it's always a pleasure to sit down and talk to you. After the filing deadline, as I say, which will be about a month from this airing, come back. We'll have this conversation again. The picture will start to get clearer, and I always appreciate your time. Thank you, Rick. Our thanks to Chairman Johnson for spending some time with us. When we come back, a final thought to the point. As I pointed out at the beginning of the show, we had our conversation with Chairman Johnson before the very latest on same-sex marriage broke here in the state. Obviously, we would have talked to him about that had it already been in the headlines. Coming up on To The Point, many more shows talking about Decision 2014, but next week, something everybody is going to be interested in, Michigan Roads. Hope you'll join us next Sunday morning, To The Point.